Welcome to the Accelerated Performance Experiment. Today's guest, Bob Proctor. Today's topic, the power of belief and positive thinking, as suggested by Lynn Jones, one of our Seeds of Excellence newsletter subscribers. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We got a very interesting program today. In fact, I'm going to go way back many years ago on how this idea today actually started. It was a guy by the name of Napoleon Hill was sitting in front of somebody by the name of Andrew Carnegie. And in that conversation that took place, Andrew Carnegie, he actually was mentoring Napoleon Hill. He gave Napoleon Hill a great idea that said any idea given to the mind that is emphasized, feared, or revered will begin immediately to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate form available to it. You know, I don't know if Napoleon Hill or Carnegie knew at that time that what started was a whole new industry, was an industry where the average person could pick up a book, could pick up a recording of some kind, and actually use it to improve the quality of their life. Yes, Na Carnegie, he really did help Napoleon Hill get focused and lead millions of people on how they can be more successful. From that point, Napoleon Hill, of course, he took and he mentored a guy by the name of Earl Nightingale. Earl Nightingale, who became a household word, just like Napoleon Hill and Carnegie, he helped and mentored a guy by the name of Bob Proctor. I'm blessed that that uh, relationship took place because since I met Bob Proctor, it's gotta be now over 30 years. He has been a mentor to me. He's been a friend to me. He's helped me in ways that others, that others may not ever understand. I'm fortunate today to introduce you to my mentor and to a great friend, Mr. Bob Proctor. Hi, Bob, and welcome. Hello there, John. You ought to get your mathematics straight, John. It's 40 years, not it's 30 years. years. Well, Bob, I'm still having a problem admitting to 40 years, okay? <laughs> Anyway, Bob, having you here today is a delight. Uh, you know, this program that everybody will be exposed to today, the title is Belief and Positive Thinking. And that title comes in from people that actually send them in to us. And the one that we pick, we always send them something like a book or a CD or something of that nature. Bob, I'd like you to start with something from Napoleon Hill that I've heard you do so many times with respect to belief. Could you kick it off with your idea on belief? Well, there's the book I've got, John. I've been reading this book since 1961. And in here, he said there's a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one's ready for something until they believe that they can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief and not mere hope or wish. Now, he said, open mind is essential for belief. Closed minds will not inspire faith, courage, or belief. And then he said, remember, no more effort is required in order to aim high in life to demand abundance and prosperity than is required to accept misery and poverty. Now, you know, I read that for a long time before I really saw the key was belief. And then I was sitting with another mentor of mine, friend of mine, friend of yours, and I was trying to figure out why I changed. i had been raised to believe that if you're going to earn a lot of money, you've got to be really smart. I had earned a lot of money and I knew I wasn't that smart. I was raised to believe if you're going to build a business or be in business or have a good position, you have to have a good formal education. I only had a couple of months high school. And yet, I'd gone on, I'd earned over a million dollars a year, I'd built a company in Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, London, England, listening to this and listening to records. And I couldn't figure out just why I changed so dramatically. And one day it dawned on me when I was sitting with Val Vandewal, he said, Bob, our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, if we reevaluate our belief system, we'll change it. 
And I thought, wow. And that's what I had meant. I had reevaluated my belief system. And I've come to the conclusion that almost all the beliefs that we inherited, because that's where they came from, very few people originate a belief, were um, ridiculous. They had no foundation. And through listening to recordings, I'm going to take you down memory lane, John. I got something here. Look at this. Yes. <laughs> We're just Hello, listening. this is Earl Nightingale. In this recording, the magic word is the first of 12 you'll receive in this series titled, How You Can Lead the Field in the Modern World. Before we start, I'd like you to know that I'm not going to try to tell I drove around with a battery-operated record player just similar to this for a few years, listening to those recordings over and over and over, and reading this book over and over and over, and everything changed. Let me finish that sentence that from the recording. He said, I'm not gonna tell you how to live your life. That's none of my business, nor is it anyone else's business. He said, it is something. He said, it'll move your life to a whole new level. Bob, with that thought in mind, sticking and holding to that idea, how often do we hear how people's lives are shaped by their environment? And I'll just quote uh, Earl and come back to you. When he said, all kinds of studies have been made regarding motivation. What is it that motivates people to do the things they do, achieve the things they achieve? And he said, while there's no pat answer to so large and complicated a question, we believe the overriding force that motivates people is due to their choice of environment. Now, Bob, I know how my life took on a different shape because my mind, my mind was connected to a lot of mediocrity that was going on around me. My wildest dreams, I didn't know how close my belief and my environment were connected. Bob, how can a person make that kind of like dramatic change from the environment they're in with people that are supposedly their best friends? You know, this is where the title of this uh, message today that the lady sent in, and I believe her name is Lynn from British Columbia. And Lynn, I think what you said is, how do we link belief with positive thinking? And how does that apply, Bob, to our environment? Because I think that's a perfect link. Would you share that with us? Well, you know, Carl Menninger from the Menninger Foundation pointed that out. He said, environment is more important than heredity. We're programmed genetically, and then we're programmed environmentally. Almost all welfare recipients are third, fourth, fifth generation welfare recipients. And I think what we have to do is just stop right in our tracks if you can hear our voices, just stop and think, how am I living? And take a look at the results you're getting, an area of happiness, health, and wealth. And then look at all the people you're surrounded by. I'm not asking if they're nice people. They probably are nice people. But are they happy? Are they healthy? Are they wealthy? And you see, 90-some percent of the population are not. And they could be loved ones, and they're people that we wouldn't want to divorce from our life. But I don't think we should let them guide our future. I think we've got to sit down and go with people that demonstrate by results that they know what they're doing and follow them. Now, that's what I've done for 52 years this October. And it's helped me earn millions of dollars. I have a company that operates in 94 countries today. I'm happy, I'm healthy, and uh, I'm going like a rocket. I'll be 79 in about a month, and I've got more energy now than when I was 29. So I think it makes sense to really consciously choose the people you're gonna spend a lot of time with because you're gonna become like them. It's like our good friend, Charlie Tremendous Jones, the late Char Charlie Tremendous Jones, he was such a good guy. He said, we're the product of the people we associate with and the books we read. I think Charlie was right. So our environment is but our looking glass is what you're saying. Well, you know, James Allen wrote that so well. He, uh, he, you know, he told us to look outside. It is a reflection of what we see inside. He said, mind is the master power that molds and makes. And man is mind. And evermore he takes the tool of thought and shaping what he wills 
He brings forth a thousand joys or a thousand ills. We think in secret, but it comes to pass. Environment is but our looking glass. Look in your bank account. Look at the friends that you associate with. Check your health out. How are you? That doing? is so important. So important what you just read there. I mean, uh, James, uh, that is what you're. What I'm actually hearing you say, Bob, and many, many times I've heard you say this. Even when we, maybe the thousands of times when we would sit and have coffee or we were on a flight, that our environment literally reveals us. It, it literally tells us exactly where we're going. It tells us what we do every day. It, and, and what is holding a person back from making that decision, Bob? I hear uh, things like, well, they, we tend to fear to move towards that which we glimpse in our most perfect moment. And yet, if our environment doesn't approve of us moving in the direction we want to move in, we would rather not succeed and keep our friends half of the time. And again, that's an unconscious decision, isn't it? Oh, yeah, well... It was that they wrote, the cave we fear to enter holds the treasure that we seek. You see, our good is all, you know, locked up inside us. And I think what we have to do is ask ourselves, why don't I go there? We're usually afraid of what somebody else would say or someone else would think. I believe we've got to get to the point where we don't give a damn what somebody else thinks. Because what somebody else thinks has no bearing on us. First of all, it's none of our business what somebody else thinks. I think we should be very aware and very concerned with what we think ourselves. Because my thoughts are really going to dictate what I attract into my life. You know, okay. go back to uh, go back to that once more, Bob. If I could get you to just stay with that, our thoughts begin to attract. You know what comes into our life. Do our thoughts have to be in a certain position? Do they have to have so many? I mean, I think you know what I'm trying to say is that there's number in motion here. Number of thoughts, state of vibration creates a picture, an image. Can you well, continue with that? Well, you know, the secret um, left people with the idea that you just want it and you attract it. And that is not correct. I think the secret did a great job. It hit 380 million people, it's estimated. But it left them with the wrong idea because you can want it. You're not going to attract it. You've got to internalize your wants. Your wants are on a conscious level. Your desires are on a subconscious. And when we think we activate brain cells and that controls the vibration we're in, our vibration controls what we attract. Vibration is a law of the universe. And vibration is a primary law. Attraction is a secondary law. So it's, it's the thoughts that we're entertaining repetitively, continually. And we're going to be thinking like the people we're surrounded by because the truth is most of the time we're not thinking. Our subconscious mind is wide open, and that's how we become a product of our environment. It's, you know, vibration is a natural law of the universe. Everything vibrates. Dr. Werner von Braun, I quoted on the sake that he said, the natural laws of the universe are so precise that we don't have any difficulty building spaceships, sh building spaceships, sending people to the moon, and you can actually time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. Well, we've got to be concerned with the vibration we're in. And if you're wondering, just ask yourself how you feel, because feeling is conscious awareness, that vibration. So that is really the trick of life. And if you keep reading this kind of material, you keep listening to the recordings, if you keep tuning into material like this, you're ultimately going to form the habit of thinking this way, and that's when good just habitually comes to you. You're never going to stop it. Times, I don't know how many times I sat in a session and heard you say that, and even today, even though that was 30 years ago, even today, I can feel a shift in my vibration just listening to what you were saying just now. This lady, Lynn, who wrote in and asked about belief and positive thinking and how that applies to our life. Let me share this with you, Bob, and then you take, take this one and put some, uh, you know, put some energy into it. You know, one of the things that I find from everybody is they tell me, I think positive, but my results don't show that. I mean, our results have to show what we are thinking. 
So are we really thinking positive or are we kind of like wishing positive and not doing anything about it? I believe that if a person would take more action, take massive action for that matter, that it will expand what is called their thinking because the vibration is going to change at that point, is it not? So can a person kind of kid themselves into saying, I believe this, but I'm not getting the result when they're really only wishing and there's no change, as you said, no change in the vibration. How can there be a change in the result, Bob? Well, I'd say I think a person uh, can think positive and they can believe something and yet it will never appear in their life. We operate on two levels, on a conscious level and a subconscious. We use a stick person for the mind. If you can see my head is my mind, everything from here up is my conscious mind, everything from here down is my subconscious. I can have a belief, if I ask you, do you believe you can earn more money? The person will say, yes, I believe it. But the results would indicate they've never heard of it. And they could be thinking of earning more money, but they're not earning more. You see, you can think it and believe it on a conscious level. If you're not internalizing it, it's never going to happen. So we actually have beliefs on two levels. We have belief on a conscious level, and then we have belief on a subconscious, and that is the paradigm. That's the uh, conditioned beliefs that have been passed along genetically and then environmentally in our little life. You can tell what a person believes on, <coughs> pardon me, on a subconscious level by observing their behavior or their results. Now, there's a beautiful word called praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. Praxis is the integration of belief with behavior. So they want to ask, do I believe I can do better? And if they say yes, well, then they've got to take and internalize that and get their actions and their results to harmonize with their beliefs. See, the problem is there's a, there's a, a difference there. There's a, 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 a connection that's not being made, and they've got to make that connection. They've got to start getting emotionally involved with that belief they've got on a conscious level. They've got to take the thoughts that they say they're thinking and internalize them, and if they don't, it's never going to happen. Now, I believe that's what happens when you get involved in like I got involved in driving around listening to this battery-operated record player for years. Everybody thought I was going crazy. I started to wonder. But it actually changed my way of thinking. And as it changes your way of thinking, your results change. You know, that's beautiful. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that everybody who's tuned into this particular message, please take this last little segment here of Bob's and play it a number of times and make some notes on it. Let me use an example of how it happened to me. It's over 30 years ago, I went to a funeral. I believe, Bob, it was your father-in-law, over 30 years ago. I had called Bob, he was going to be in town just for the funeral, and he had to leave immediately right after the funeral. And if I was going to get a chance to spend some time with him, he said, you're going to have to come down to the funeral parlor. Now, there was one problem with that. As a little boy, uh, some uncles and aunts sat me in the coffin with my grandfather, which I never got over, never got over it. And now I'm going down to this funeral parlor, which I had never gone into one since I was a little boy. I was inside, I was starting to almost get ready to, to throw up all over the street. I walked away, got in my car, got out of the car, went back to the funeral parlor five times. Finally, I walked in. And I walked in and I sat at a table with Bob. He had maybe 10 minutes. And he drew a picture of what he was just talking to everybody about with the stick person, about how consciously we believe it. And I did. Consciously, I believed I was going to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And I did on around March the 28th, 1973, Bob has that gold card. I wrote on a gold card, and consciously I believed it, but within me there was this tremendous fear just like that funeral parlor. But yet, and I filled that out two years prior, but yet when I wrote on that, that I was going to be doing the program seminars with Bob, it came true on February the 28th, 1973. Again, that day when I sat in that funeral parlor and you wrote on 
that you put the stick man on a sheet of paper. That day I felt a change instantly when you put that stick person on that sheet of paper. So Bob, I'd like you to bring us in for a landing here with regards to the belief and positive thinking and how those two things work together with vibration to change a result. Well, you know, there's only been, this has only happened twice in the 52 years that I've studied this that I can remember. Napoleon Hill said, write what you want on a card. Write it in the present tense. This is my goal card. I told John, write what you want on a card. And you've got to believe it. Now, this was around, I don't know, 1970, 71, when John's talking about it. He wrote on the card that he was going to be conducting a seminar with me on March the 28th, 1974. And I thought, well, we'll see. You know, I had a lot of people tell me that, but I'd never seen anybody do it. I thought he really doesn't believe what he's, or doesn't understand what he's talking about, doesn't understand the price he's got to pay, the studying that he's got to do to prepare himself to literally and effectively teach this. But he followed me everywhere I went. I'd see him show up in a seminar. If I was on the West Coast, if I was in the South or somewhere, I was traveling for, for Nightingale at the time. I was a vice president of sales. And I would see him sitting there in the front room, row, and he's taking notes and taking notes. On the 27th of February, or of March, 1974, I was in Chicago. I was to do a seminar the next day in Belleville, Ontario, where John lived. And O'Hare got snowed in. I couldn't get out. There was no way we could reach the people that were coming to this seminar. And right to the day that he had written on the card, he had written it a couple years before. John was in the front of the room doing the seminar. There was nobody else there to do it. I saw that happen with a vice president in Prudential. George Fint did a similar thing. Now, it happens to everybody that writes it on the card and believes it. Rarely does it happen right to the day. You see, we're guessing at the date. Spirit knows the date. We don't. We're guessing at it. And that is because the idea that you write on the card is a seed. And that seed grows by law. It grows and then manifests by the law of gender. And that law states that all seeds have a gestation or an incubation period. But no one knows what the incubation period is for a non-physical seed. We know what it is for carrots and wheat and potatoes and things like that. For physical seeds, but not for spiritual seeds, which is a non-physical seed, an idea. But he did it. And he did it right to the day. And you can do it. Now, you may not do it right to the day. I'll share another one with you that's about the same, John. Mark Victor Hansen and I were doing a seminar with Jack Canfield and Lee Poulos, a few people, in California. And Mark and Jack had started, they were going to publish Chicken Soup for the Soul. And they said, give us some stories, Proctor. you got lots of stories. And he said, we're going to publish this. And Mark said, we're going to sell it to 50 million people. And I'm thinking, you know, you sell a million books, you're doing well, Mark. But I mean, we're teaching this, so I couldn't tell him that he couldn't do it. Well, he taught me a great lesson. He said they're going to sell 50 million before the turn of the century. They didn't sell 50 million. They sold 74 million before the turn of the century, which was 2000. They've gone on to sell over a billion books and then sold the company for millions of dollars. So you see, Carnegie was right. Any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized. That's either feared or revered. will begin at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate form available. You've got to believe. William James said, believe, and your belief will actually create the fact. It was a good point for us to talk on, John. I enjoyed it. Bob, it sure was. And I, I just, uh, hey, listen, I'm just sitting here just like it was the first time. <laughs> Uh, just like 30 years ago so i i can't thank you enough for being on here it's been uh it's been a treat and uh i feel i i feel absolutely uh wonderful about
share, uh, one, so share one thing with the audience while I get something, John. Okay, I will. You know, why? Uh, when uh, Bob was talking about believe in your belief will create the fact, I can't help to go back to when, in a seminar, when someone said, well, are any of these based on, you know, religious principles or Christian principles? And I said, you know, there's one specific I, I, idea I'd like to share with a lot of people who ask that question a whole lot. And it goes something like this, and you can look it up in Mark 11, 24. You know, where it was said, whatsoever things that you desire, believe that you have, receive them, and they are yours. Now, he didn't say, believe you might receive them. He didn't say there's a chance you could receive them, or if you know the right people. He said, believe you already received them when you pray, and they are yours. Bob. John, here's a collector's copy of Think and Grow Rich that I had the good fortune to be asked to write a forward to. Whoa. It's a hardcover. It's a collector's copy. I've got two here. I've got one for you, and you send one to the lady that sent in the question. I'll give them to you. Thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate that. Are you home today? <laughs> I'm, thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. Hey, mine too, Bob. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks, Rick, for uh, putting on this program and Josh for all your assistance. Bye-bye. This has been the Accelerated Performance Experiment with today's guest, Mr. Bob Proctor, discussing the power of belief and positive thinking. Our next guest, JK Certified Life Coach, Ms. Emmeline Noiseau, airing Monday, June 3rd at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you haven't subscribed for our Seeds of Excellence newsletter, visit www.johncanary.com and fill out the form for your free copy of Sales Mastery. Thanks for tuning in. 